Thank you this morning uh, to the Barrios clan for reading for us. Always good. Well, so good to be with you, and thank you for joining us. Um, if you're visiting for the first time, uh, welcome. It's good to be with you. It was almost game time at West Middle School, an afternoon, Friday afternoon game between West Middle School and South Middle School. They were the two best flag football teams in the city of Downey, California. South Middle School was defeated 5-0, and they thought they were unbeatable. West was 4-1 and the second best record in the league. The referee blew the whistle, the ball was kicked off, and as the game started, both teams competed. They competed hard, back and forth, play after play, touchdown after touchdown, neck and neck. And with less than one minute left in regulation, West Middle School's quarterback, John Yale, throws a deep pass into the end zone. It goes over the head of the South Middle School cornerback. If you don't know what a cornerback is, it's the, the position that guards the wide receiver. And so the wide receiver catches the ball, touchdown, West Middle School wins the game. They beat South Middle School, but they were crowned co-champions that year. After the game, the coach rallied the team together from South Middle School. And all the players were bummed out. They were upset. They were angry some. And yet the cornerback who missed the play felt terrible, disappointed. In fact, he wept a little for letting the team down, for losing the game. Now, I can tell you that story so vividly because the cornerback was me. I missed the play. It went over my head. But you know, this team was full of a bunch of good kids. <laughs> they told me, don't worry about it. It's all good. We still won the championship. But as an eighth grader, it was a learning experience. The lesson I learned that day was humility. That we were not as good as I thought we were. That I wasn't as good as I thought I was. That I needed to bring down the level of my pride. That I needed to modify my opinion of my team and of my football skills. But you shouldn't feel so bad for us, for these athletes, because we went on to win the championship in basketball, baseball, and volleyball that year. So we had some really good times. But that football game right there, I believe, prepared us for the rest of the year. Sometimes one has to recalibrate the level of one's humility. Today's sermon is titled, Let Humility Compel You. You know, whenever I see a scripture that starts off with uh, a meal or going to a meal uh, or about food, you know something good is coming. <laughs> as though food somehow feeds wisdom, as though somehow food, uh, you know, it, it somehow fuels spirituality. And so this... Uh, pericope, this, this extraction of this passage, I think depends a lot on this understanding about food. A meal, a dinner, a wedding party, a host, seating arrangements, a list of guests. But what's so conflicting about this dinner party, about this wedding feast, is how it was prepared. One cannot... Uh, Minimize the previous passages regarding this invitation because not everyone was invited, not everyone was welcomed. I think of the crippled woman from last week's sermon, hunched over and surely on the outside looking in. And I think of the man just a few verses before in this passage that was suffering from abnormal swelling in his body. Surely he was not on the guest list. But Jesus does something that is the least expected thing to do, he takes over the party. He becomes the host. He critiques the dining practices of the guests. Because seating arrangements should not be by rank 
or by status or by hierarchy. And he quickly assesses the, the host as well. He assesses that, uh, uh, pointing out that the guest list should not just include the rich and the privileged and the religious. Have you asked yourself, why would Jesus do such a thing? Why not stay quiet? Why not ignore the whole thing? Why not be indifferent and say, not my problem? Why not just be polite and not critique the moment? If we're honest with ourselves, we would probably remain silent. We would just let the injustice happen. So not to offend the host or the prestigious list of guests. So not to be kicked out of the party. Was Jesus being rude? Was Jesus being inappropriate? After all, the guests were exalting themselves. They were choosing their place of honor, rewarding themselves, playing by the rules of the system, simply following the order of things. And apparently humility was not a virtue in this moment. What would compel Jesus to speak up? What would compel you to speak up? You see, here is where I believe the wisdom enters the room this morning. This is where we invite the holy presence of God, the Holy Spirit that has come to guide us, counsel us, comfort us, has come to help us. Because today's wisdom is for all those who are attempting to live like Jesus on earth today. Did you hear me? For those who want to be true students of the teacher who want to understand the essence of Jesus' ministry on earth because humility is a virtue that is clearly embodied in Jesus. And here's the wisdom. Humility. It's not so much about what people think about you. Rather, it is more about what God thinks of you. What does God think of you? This is to say that humility is something that makes us more like Jesus, that makes us more like the divine. How is your humility doing this morning? Would you consider yourself full of humi humility? Or would you consider yourself empty on humility? There's a biblical understanding of humility from a Greek word that just simply means not to rise too high from the ground. Or to bring down one's pride or to have a modest opinion of yourself. It is truly a mindset that acknowledges the necessity of the divine, of the dependence on the creator. How can one have great dependence in God? See, I think, I believe, and I believe that it begins by knowing that we are all this ongoing piece of art and that this artist, this creator, this, this, this author of our life is continually working on us, healing us, perfecting us, preparing us, molding us, redeeming us. From what? From all the abuse, from all of the mistreatment in this world. Because if we face it, this world has somehow distorted us, misguided us, jaded us, hurt us made us to do dysfunctional things, made us to say and think oppressive things. You see, humility is probably the last thing that we want to acquire to combat such things. But I want to offer you a broader understanding of humility this morning. One must understand, firstly, you know, Jesus is suggesting some very radical things in this passage. Remember, these people were religious people. These were religious leaders, devout Jews, well-respected people. And Jesus is asking these elite guests to have a modest opinion of themselves. Jesus is asking the host, a prominent Pharisee, a special religious leader, to invite the unclean, to invite the unworthy, the irreligious, to attend his din dinner party. Do you see how submersive this is? Do you see how revolutionary this moment is? And it is clear that humility was lacking in this party. But you know what existed with abundance? Systems. 
Systems of dominance, of power, of privilege, of status. You know, the injustice of society, the injustice of empire, of institution, of religion. It could no longer go unchecked under the eye of Jesus. But I, 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 I seem to know this too well, because it's not too different in our society today. Historically and in the present, America, Christianity, most of religion still largely operates by these same systems. Hierarchy, power, dominance, privilege, white supremacy, and status. But the conundrum with all of this this morning is that these teachings of Jesus are nothing like those systems at play. And in a room full of social system climbers, in a room of full of elites who want the best position, Jesus comes and announces a rearrangement of the whole thing. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He has come to make things just for those who have been left out of the dinner party. And so the way this dinner was presented, the way it was organized, the way it was prepared, was out of sorts, shall we say, not aligned with the essence of humility. And this is why I believe, because of this reality right here, Jesus did not remain silent. Humility wouldn't allow it. Even the religious even in circles of denominations, in societal circles today, where much of these sinful systems are at play, one cannot remain silent. How many tables, how many circles are missing important voices? The voice of a woman, the voice of a person of color, of an LGBT individual, of an indigenous voice, of a young voice. And not only do we need a voice in the room, but we need voices of leadership at the table. It is needed, it is vital, and it is way overdue. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. You see, humility, it compels us. We can't remain silent. And I guess what I'm submitting to you this morning is that Jesus is perhaps, not perhaps, Jesus is the ultimate embodiment of humility. That Jesus, although God, right, fully God, did not abuse or misuse his power. Instead, became a servant and with humility walked the road to the cross. Mistreated, abused, ridiculed, murdered. And somehow, this teaching of who Jesus is in humility teaches us how we must also modify our lives. It teaches us how humility calls us to serve others. It teaches us to speak out for others. And what's fascinating is, well, who do we speak out for? Well, Jesus said it right here in the same scripture, the lame, the crippled, the blind. But, you know, in those terms today, maybe we need to kind of extend them, broaden them a little bit more because really what some of these words are talking about is, is the powerless, the, the voiceless, the, 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 those that are, that are down and out, you know, those who are not only blind physically but blind mentally. And that somehow these groups are groups that we need to go out and speak for because they are the groups that cannot repay us. How could they? Humility, humility's reward, humility's payment, is not something someone can give you. It is not repaid by someone else. It can only be repaid by the divine, by God. And so that is how humility works. It is not what people think of you. It is all about what God thinks of you. And so no longer is it about like we trying to do something so that people see how humble you are. It's about God knowing inside of you 
exists humility. When you're given the opportunity to exercise humility, have you done so? Will you remain silent, indifferent, play along with the unjust systems at work? Or will you use your influence, your gifts, your talents, your position, your status, your wealth, to make this world more just, more inclusive? Because humility is not what we've all thought it was. It is not passive. Humility is demands a zeal and passion and action. Who will you invite to your dinner party? Your friends? Your family? Your colleagues? Your rich neighbors? Or will you invite the helpless, the powerless, the blind, the injured and the disabled? You see, that kind of party, with those kinds of people in the room, now that is a party full of humility. You know, we experience humility every week in this church. It is our weekly dinner party, shall we say, at Calvary by the Sea. It's our communion table. It is set up week after week by Renee. Where's Renee? She's over there. And by others. Prepares the meal, shall we say. But we do not exclude. We do not place restrictions or abide by some religious rules. We don't invite only the rich, only the Lutheran, only the Christian, only the heterosexual. We do not just invite our friends and families and rich neighbors and church members. Rather, we invite the unworthy, the helpless, the powerless, the blind, the injured. Because they cannot repay us. And we invite Jesus to take over this dinner party. To make it a weekly visible sign of things to come where there will be no more separation and no more rejection. And not by gender or by age or by race or ethnicity or the color of your skin or tax bracket or identity. Instead, Jesus converts this space into a place where we are all one. You may call it a table of humility. Jesus, the embodiment of humility, did not remain silent, did not stand by and watch the oppression and injustice. Instead, he spoke up, and not only did he speak out, but he gave his life for it, demonstrating humility by dying on a cross, takes away our sins and transgressions, our failures, our pride, our indifference, and gives us his forgiveness, his righteousness, his successes, and his forgiveness. And resurrected on the third day to give us the apex of reality, this omega point in history of liberating us and healing us and making us whole once again. But what shall we do with such wholeness and love? With such a moment so undeserving, we're not worthy of it. Perhaps all we can do is modify who we think we are. I'll say that again. Perhaps all we can do is modify who we think we are. What if I told you that we are the helpless? That we are the powerless? That we are the broken ones? that we are the ones in desperate need of a God? What if we've been thinking about this the whole wrong way? We don't deserve to be at this table either. No one is worthy, and yet all are welcomed. See, that's the beauty of the gospel. Oh God, come now, help us. Help me to modify my humility. We reject the prideful systems created by society, by institutions, and by religious that attempt to, to, to categorize people and oppress people. Come, Jesus, do away with all 
such things and heal our communities, heal our institutions, heal our churches, heal our communities. Heal us. So to be agents of humility in this world. And all of God's people said, Amen.